Amen. So 1 Samuel 28, if you remember last week, uh, David had fled into the land of the Philistines. And it was said there that, uh, you know, at this point in the story, basically Saul and, and, and uh, David aren't going to see each other anymore. And we're kind of coming to the end here of Saul's, uh, you know, end of his life. In fact, we're looking at the day before his last day on earth. So it's an interesting ch passage, one that most people are familiar with. And really verses 1 through uh, 1 and 2, you know, where, where we see David, uh, you know, go, uh, saying he's going to go with Achish and prove himself. It says in verse 2, And David said to Achish, Surely thou wilt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make thee keeper of mine he head forever. You know, that we'll, we'll develop that more later uh, next week. We kind of get into more of the details about that and that whole situation. But it's kind of alarming if you're not familiar with the story to see David at this point where he's, you know, he's on, I, I wouldn't want to go, it, it kind of one makes you wonder, where is he really? Is he just saying these things? Is he just kind of going along? And we know ultimately next week in the next chapter, you know, God prevents him from going and doing something. Whether or not he would have gone through with it or not and fighting his own brethren, I, I don't know. Um, is he just kind of telling Achish what he wants to hear here? Uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, thing to think about, about where David has gotten in his life. But uh, again, uh, we'll talk more about that in, coming up. That's, more, that's addressed more in the next chapter. It's just kind of telling us here you know, where David is in the story. And the rest of it kind of goes on, obviously, to focus on Samuel. And there's a lot here, a lot of interesting things. One, and it says there in verse 3, Now Samuel is dead. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those, familiar, those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. You know, that's, there's several things that we can learn from that. And one is that, you know, Saul wasn't, Saul was a wicked guy at this point in his life. He's not doing anything good. You know, he's chasing David off. And God has, you know, rejected him as king. But, you know, there were still some good things that, that Saul did. You know, and what, what, what point during his reign he did, the, the, what point he uh, put out the spirits and the wizards and things, we're not exactly sure, but whenever he did that, you know, that was the right thing to do. You know, we'll talk about it here in a minute, but the fact is that, you know, the Bible condemns those that have familiar spirits. It condemns wizards and necromancers and, and, and witches and warlocks and all this, this type of thing. Anything that's occultish is what we would call it today. The Bible condemns that, and Saul putting these people out of the land was a good thing that he did. So Saul wasn't a completely rotten person. There were some things he did that were good. Now, does it outweigh all the evil that he did? You know, like, oh, I don't know, slaying 70 of God's priests? No. Obviously, you know, Saul's got coming what he's got coming. But he did do some things that were good, and this is one of them, I believe. But, you know, even in, the, even in him doing this good thing, he makes himself out like a total hypocrite because he goes on here and goes to consult one of the people that he had condemned and put out of the land. You know, he's putting him out of the land, and it says in verse 5, And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And, you know, obviously, this probably wasn't always the case with him. There was probably a time in Saul's life, and as we're coming to the end of it, you know, it's important to look back and remember how Saul started out. A humble person, you know, somebody that was being used of God. And in a different set of circumstances, you know, or excuse me, rather identical circumstances, when he was right with God, this would not have been his reaction. He would not have feared. He would not have trembled. And it just goes to show you when you get out of sorts with God, you know, you're not going to have peace. You're, you're not going to have that confidence. You're not going to have that boldness to take the stand that you need to take. You know, this same set of circumstances back in, earlier on in his reign, he would have been like, hey, no problem. The Lord's on my side. Let's go fight God's enemies and win a great victory. But now because he's, you know, God has forsaken him, because God is no longer with him, the Spirit of God is no longer upon him, now he's having a reaction of fear, trembling. And it says, he, you know, his heart greatly trembled. You know, he's very afraid here. In verse 6, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not. You know, and that's a frightening thing. And the Bible says, you know, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. You know, the, 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 the he that, that uh, you know, I'm just trying to quote it off the cuff here, but, you know, you know, he that, uh, I know this isn't right, but disregarded the law, basically, even his prayer shall be an abomination. You know, God's not just this vending machine. God's not just this person that's just always standing by to hear our prayers when we're completely out of sorts with him. You know, when, when, we're, when we're backslidden, we're, you know, when we're not right with God, you know, God's not going to hear certain prayers. There's just going to be like, why would, you know, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, a, a brash thing to do. That Saul's doing here. You know, he's completely out of sorts with God, yet he still has the audacity to go and make, you know, wants to hear from God. 
when God has told him, I'm done with you, and he's doing wicked things, you know, all the wicked things that he's done to David, killing God's priests, so on and so forth, all these wicked things, and yet he still has this audacity to go to God and make this prayer. You know, and sometimes we can, you know, if we're not careful, we can be the same way. You know, if we get out of sorts with God, we have sin in our life, and then, you know, we get in some circumstance, it's like, okay, now I'm ready to talk to God. Okay. You know, well, you know, God probably, I don't know how, how much he really appreciates that. You know, God would probably appreciate that if we, you know, we would talk to God, if we would talk to him and speak to him and make our requests known unto him, you know, when we're trying to be right with God. You know, that's the time to go to God, and, and not just when things are bad and tough and when we're afraid. And it says there in verse 6, And Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him not. And you can see why he's greatly feared. You know, because he knows that without God, he can't do anything. Right. And look, when, when, when we're out of sorts with God, that's the time to be afraid. Because you never know what can happen. You know, when God just kind of pulls back and says, you know what, have it your way. You know, things can go bad. And he says that he answered him not, neither by dreams. You know, and this is a way that, you know, we often see God speaking. I don't believe this is something that's necessarily applicable today. But we do see in the Old Testament God speaking to his prophets through visions and things like that. Uh, even Peter in, in the Old Testament was given a vision. He fell into a trance, if you recall, in the book of Acts. You know, this is a way that God used to speak. You know, but God, in these last days, has spoken unto us by his Son. You know, we have the Word of God. You, know, you say, well, I want God to speak to me you know, through dreams. Well, he's given you a whole book. You know, and and, and we, that's how we communicate with the Lord now. We pray, and he speaks to us through the Word. So, but you, know, you read this, you think, well, does God still speak to us that way? I, I don't believe so. I believe we have more than, than we need in the, in the Word of God. So it says he doesn't spoke to him by dreams, nor by Urim, nor, or by the prophet, nor by prophets. So it used to be God would send the prophet. You remember Nathan would came to David later. You know, Saul, or excuse me, um, 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 Samuel was the one that was coming in his day to Saul to speak to him and tell him what's up. None of that's happening anymore. He doesn't have anybody to come and say, thus saith the Lord. Okay? And that one there, nor by Urim, some people get confused. What does that mean? And basically, Urim was just a part of the breastplate that, the, that the, the Levites wore, the priests specifically, that they would wear. And I don't want to go into all that, you know, but if, if you've read your Bible and you kind of pay attention when that Urim and Thummim come up, you know, that's talking about a priestly garment. And it was something that was used, that the priests would use to kind of discern God's will. We don't know a lot about it, but that's basically, you know, the long and short of it. And so basically saying, look, he's not getting any dreams. God's not giving him visions. God's not speaking to him directly. And he's not getting you know, anything from the priests, you know, by, through the Urim. And he's not, no prophets are coming to him. God's just completely cut him out. God is no longer speaking to Saul whatsoever. And, you know, rather than Saul just kind of accepting his fate and just kind of going, going into it, you know, be, he, he, he becomes a complete hypocrite at the end here. And it says there in verse 7, Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit. Oh, you mean all those ones you put out of the land? Right. Not, and the ones you said, Hey, they shouldn't be around. No one should be consulting with them until I get in a bad spot. Now I'm going to go talk to them, right? <clears throat> so this is just how far down Saul has fallen. To, even now he's going to, Hey, God's not speaking to me. I'm going to go find you know, some witch, basically, is what it is, to talk to me. And... and and he goes there in verse, and continues on, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. So they're like, Hey, we know this one. You know, we can go talk to her. Apparently she, she made it through, uh, you know, the excommunication or whatever it was. Maybe she just shut up and quit doing it. You know, took the palm reading sign down from out in front of her house and just, you know, went underground. But what this kind of reminds me of, this whole situation with Saul where, you know, he, he, he did a good thing in putting these people out of the land, but then that, when times get tough, you know, he's going back and trying to find one to consult with them. You know, I think we can apply this to the fact that, you know, sometimes we as Christians, we'll get sin out of our life, you know, but then a lot of times we go back to it. You know, we backslide. You know, it's like the sin, or excuse me, the Christian who kind of, you know, gets right with God, starts cleaning up his life, gets certain things out of his life, but then a circumstance comes around or something like that, and next thing you know, they're, they're digging back through the dumpster trying to get their sin back out. And that's exactly what's going on here. It's a great picture of that, is, is you have a saved person like Saul who has made the right decisions in the past, gotten sin out of the land, but now he's going back to it. He's backsliding very hard. And if you would, go over to, uh, go over to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Because here's the thing, you know, getting right and staying right are two different things. You know, it's one thing to get right with God, 
which is a great thing to do. You know, we should all endeavor to do that. But, you know, once you get right, the real challenge comes, and it's like, okay, you got right, now stay right. That's the real difficulty in the Christian life. You know, it's real easy to get fired up, you hear a sermon or read something in the Bible, and you say, yeah, I'm going to get this sin out of my life, or maybe I'm going to start this godly habit, you know, I'm going to take this stand, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to uh, put this, uh, you know, this standard in my life, and I'm going to start living up to this, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. You know, and you clean up your life, you're getting right with God, that's great. But just, just know that, you know, the real challenge is staying right. You know, especially when it's something that, you know, no one's going to pat you on the back over and say, good job. You know, I'm glad you're doing that. And really, a lot of things in the Christian life, you know, we're just doing what we ought to do. You know, we've only done that, which is our duty. You're like, hey, I started reading my Bible. You want a, you want a cookie? Do you want a gold star? You know, hey, I started to come to church. Yeah, that's like, that's like Christian life 101. I started praying. Oh, well, good job. You know, and a lot of times people fall out of those habits because, you know, that's just something we should do. You know, and, and that's why the Christian life often in these areas is difficult because of the fact that, you know, we're not, we're not being acknowledged. Now, here's the thing. God sees all that. God sees, you know, we, man, man's never going to come to you and praise you for that or whatever, but God sees when we're faithful in these areas, <coughs> and he'll bless it. But that is the trick, isn't it? That is the, 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 you know, the hard part of the Christian life. It's one thing to, to, to get in the habit of doing something that you should do or getting out of the habit of something you shouldn't do, but maintaining that is the real challenge. And so often, you know, we go back to our old sins. People will go back to their old sins and, and, and backslide. And the Bible says, as a dog returneth to his vomit. You know, it's, that's not a very, these are the Bible words, folks. You know, God's giving us this visual. As a, as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. When God looks down and sees his children going back to some sin that they got out of their life, he, he, that's how he describes it. It's like him watching a dog going and eating its own vomit. And that's quite, you know, that, and maybe if we looked at it more like that, maybe if we would see whatever sin we're going back to or however we're getting backslidden, as, as God describes it, you know, we might be a little less prone to do it. We'll say, hey, you know what, I, I know I got this right, I know I got this out of my life, but I'm just going to go back and do this now. And just think about, it's like me, it'd be like, it's like God seeing a dog eat its own vomit. You know, get that image in your mind and hold it there. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's in the Bible. You know, I'm not saying anything beyond what the Bible says. It's a grotesque picture, isn't it? It's not, you know, you're not going to like, oh, that, what a cute puppy. And think, well, I want, you know, take that dog home. But this is what dogs do. And, you know, and it also shows us that it's a very foolish thing to do. The Bible says, so a fool returneth to his folly. You know, why would we go back to those things? Well, you know, why would we have any pleasure in those things which of we are now ashamed? You know, why would we go back to these old sins? You know, obviously we're not stupid. We know that there's pleasure in sin for a season, but we should consider the consequences. Because, you know, getting right and staying right are two different things. And, the, you know, part of, the, part of what's going to help you stay right is when you understand that, uh, you know, there are consequences for going back. You know, the dog that goes back to its vomit has bad breath, right? <laughs> You know, it, there's bad, con there's, you know, and I'm just kind of making a joke there, but there is a bit grain of truth to that, right? When we go back to our sin, it's not like it's without consequences. You know, Saul's going back to this witch at, en at Endor who has a familiar spirit. There's consequences involved for him doing that. God's not just turning a blind eye and saying, well, I don't blame him. I'm not talking to him anymore. You know, he, no, there are consequences involved for what he's doing. And maybe we would be more prone to stay right with God if we understood that when we go back to our folly, when we go back to our sin, when we, like a dog, go back to our vomit, there is consequences that come with that. Especially as God's children. You know, God chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. And, neither, and you know, there's no son whom he chasteneth not. <coughs> the, exa you know, the example I thought of was, you know, uh, the, the drunk who says, you know, the guy who gets real drunk, right? And then he, say, you know, he says, I'm never drinking again. You know, when he's, when he's curled up on the bathroom floor in front of the toilet, you know, puking his guts out, right? That's a real easy time to say, oh, that's it, never again. I'm never doing that again. I'm never going to do this again. But, you know, when someone's gotten away from a sin like that for a while, and maybe they kind of forgot what that experience was like, then they might think, well, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad after all. And they kind of go back to it. But, you know, if we would keep in our minds that whenever we indulge in sin, you know, there's negative consequences, 
we'd probably be less likely to go back to them. You know, and you can apply that to, to, to so many sins. And we, if we understood this, you know, like the Bible says in Proverbs that the way of the transgressor is hard. You know, and maybe we've never even gotten into sin. Maybe it's not even a matter of us going back to some sin. Maybe we're just never, never lived like that, never been, at, you know, never taken part in those type of things. And, we, and people start to get curious and wonder, well, was it really that bad? It, you know, is drinking, is smoking pot, you know, or is committing fornication, you know, is it really as bad as the preacher says? Is it really as bad as my parents have told me or whoever has told me? Is it really that bad? Hey, the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. And there's always consequences for sin. You know, and sometimes we think, well, it's just my sin. It's not going to affect anybody else. But a lot of times, even the sins that we think aren't going to affect anybody else, they do affect other people. True. And look, if, you know, especially us as, that, are, that are husbands and, and fathers, you know, when we get into some kind of a sin, you know, God chastens us. How could that not affect our families? You know, whatever happens to dad, you know, that, that's why dads, you know, usually get the life insurance, right? Because if dad goes down, you know, mom's got to have something to rely, you know, if I'm the provider, I'm the sole provider, you know, I'm the spiritual leader in the home, I'm the one that's guiding and leading that house, you know, if, if I get taken out, there's a big void there, right? So don't ever get this, you know, and, 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 and don't ever get this idea at, that, you know, well, it's just this sin, it's my own sin, nobody knows about it, it's, you know, and if God punishes me, that's okay. You know, I can live with that. We don't know how far, you know, sin is going to take us or how, you know, what the ramifications are. Do you really think Saul would have gone to this witch if he knew that it was going to end up the way it ended up with, with, you know, did he, and it's almost foolish. Why did you even, what did you think, you know, Samuel was going to say? No, oh, well, since you came to a witch, you know, I, I can see how desperate you are. Let me do you a favor, right? Let me throw your bone here, Saul. No, he gets, con he gets rebuked and condemned, Right? If he, if he knew that was the news he was going to get, hey, tomorrow you're going to die and so are all your sons. Do you think he would have gone to the witch? You know, you know, we would be a lot less likely to go back to our sin if we would just stop and think about the fact that there are consequences, that the way of the transgressor is hard. We'd be, a lot less, we'd be more likely to maintain good works. We'd be more likely to stay right after we get right if we'd understand that there are consequences. And again, you know, nobody understands this better than the transgressor himself. And people that have lived, you know, a wicked life in the past, that have indulged in certain sins and have gotten right with God, they'll be the first ones to tell you that it's not worth it, that the Bible's right, that all these things, you know, that, that the way of the transgressor is hard. And you say, well, you know, if that's true, then why is it that people go back? Why do people go back? If, well, all your, if everything you're saying, if it has all these negative consequences, if God looks at it and says it's like a dog going back to vo his vomit, you know, why does a dog go back to his vomit? Why is it? Why do Christians backslide even when they know that there's consequences for their sin? Why do they do that? Well, you know, one, there's the allure of sin, but also a lot of times people are more prone to backslide and go back to old sins that they're familiar with when times are tough. Now, I'm not saying Saul he was consulting witches in the past. I'm just kind of using this as a springboard. But look, you will be more tempted to go back to sin or get involved in sin when you're going through a hard time in your life. And anybody that has a past with certain sins that has opened the doors to, you know, drugs, alcohol, pornography, fornication, you know, these sins of the flesh, you know, you're a lot more likely to go back to those things when you're under times of stress. You know, because... A lot of times people use those type of things, you know, pot and drugs and so on and so forth, to s escape pressure. They, 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 they use it to kind of like detach from reality, to not have to deal with some kind of stress in their life, you know, at least even if it's just momentarily. But, you know, that's never a solution for your problems. You know, you're th you know when you sober up, when you come to your senses, your problems are still there. And now your mind's just more clouded or whatever, you can't deal with it. But that's what I think is going on here. You know, Saul, you know, why did he go to such an extreme as to consult a witch? Well, look at his circumstances. God's not talking to him anymore. He's got the Philistines pile, you know, coming up against him. Where, you know, he might even be thinking at this point, boy, I sure could use David's help. <laughs> you know, sure. David's gone. You know, he, I don't even know that he knows where, you know, what David's up to at this point. He might just think he's completely out of the picture. Or he might even understand, oh, David's over on their side now. Now he's really sweating. I mean, there's a lot that could potentially have taken place here. But the point is this, is that, you know, Saul went to these extreme measures 
when times got tough. And that's when we are going to find ourselves the most tempted, you know, to quit on God, to throw in the towel. You know, when a church, when, a, when, a, when we go through some kind of persecution, either as a church or as an individual in our personal life, you know, sometimes people start to weigh things out and say, is this really worth it? You know, I understand that li- you know, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution, but when that actually starts to happen, people start to go, well, maybe this godly living thing isn't for me then. You know, it might be a lot easier to just kind of quit on God, quit on the church, and just kind of throw in the towel and go back to my old ways because it's easier. You know, and I've seen people quit the Christian life, and I've, and I've heard what they say afterwards, and, a lot, and this is the testimony a lot of them have. Oh, it feels like such a weight has been relieved. It feels like such a burden has been taken off my shoulders. You know why they say that? Because it's true. Because the, the Christian life is, is a life, there is a burden to bear. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. That we are to bear our cross daily. That, you know, there is a burden to be born in the Christian life. I'm not going to get up here and try to, and, you know, you know, make you think that, you know, resisting sin, resisting sin living a godly life is easy. Because it's not. Right. It's a burden that's born. You know, it's something we, we have to put on the armor of God every day. We have to stand against the flesh. Paul said, I die daily. You know, there, there's a battle in the Christian life. It's a fight. And we are to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, the Bible says. And look, when people want to get out of the fight, they feel like, oh, a burden has been lifted, you know. I can do whatever I want. You know, I don't have to worry about what the Bible says so much anymore. And they think for, you know, they have some relief, but in the long run, do they really? You know, God's not just going to let us go scot-free. And what about when that, an individual like that gets to heaven? And they see the people that, you know, that did stick with it. They do see the people that did bear their burden, that did bear their cross, and they're being rewarded, and they're being praised in heaven. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, we should desire to hear those words. You think, well, you know, I went through, the, I lived my life on earth, and, uh, you know, I was kind of a closet Christian. You know, I kind of didn't do anything for God, and, and, you know, I had an okay time doing it. While I was down there, I didn't have to put up with a lot of the persecution or have to fight the flesh or do anything like that. But you know what? When you get to heaven, that's, you're going to regret that. You're going to wish you could go back and take on that burden. You're going to wish you could go back and bear that cross and fight that battle and endure that hardness. <clears throat> but people tend to go back a lot of times when they're under pressure and they're d- difficult su- circumstances. Are you there? So, so what's the solution? You know, I'm, I'm presenting you the problem, right? I'm saying, hey, this is, this is the pitfall in the Christian life. You say, well, I don't want to fall into it. What do I do? Well, look at Romans chapter 13, verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. You know, if we have a past with certain sins, you know, we should probably steer clear of those areas that, you know, remind us of, of those sins or we'll, we'll be more tempted to get involved in them. Right. You know, and a lot of this could, you could apply directly to relationships. You know, when, if, if you want to clean up your life, you know, maybe there's some certain relationships that you have to cut out of your life because those people, all they want to do is they want to get you back into that old sin. You know, and they think it's strange that you run not to the same, you know, riot of excess as them. You know, they, they think, well, you used to, you know, you used to run with us, man. You used to do this sin and, and talk like this. And we could have these conversations about these ungodly things and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, and we try to hang with those people, you know, and be around them without doing what they do. It's very hard to do. I mean, I know how many guys have come to me and said, hey, you know, I work at this job and I'm the only Christian there and I don't fit in. You know, and I have a real hard time getting along with the other guys. I was like, yeah, well, welcome to the club. I remember going through that exact same thing. This crew didn't want me because I, you know, I wasn't all about beers and deers. You know, this crew didn't want me because I didn't want to laugh at their filthy jokes or hang out with them on the weekend and get drunk or whatever or look at something that they want to show me on their phone, some ungodliness. Say, well, this guy's a stick in the mud. I don't want him around. Yeah, that's part of the burden we have to bear. You know, but it would be a lot easier to just give in. And just say, well, I'm just going to be one of the guys. You know, just going to hang out and get involved in whatever sin. Look, that's making provision for the flesh. And if we have to cut out certain relationships, maybe even change jobs. I, I've done that. You know, that's something that might have to take place if it's feasible. You know, or maybe we just have to quit hanging out with certain people, going to certain functions, being around certain things, if it's going to cause us to fall and stumble and go back to our vomit. Because that's far worse, you know, to get backslidden. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, another way to avoid this pitfall of backsliding, of being like a Saul, you know, when you get in these difficult circumstances, circumstances, 
you know, is, is having the word of God in your heart. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, what's going to help you not sin against God? His word. You know, if we're reading God's word, if we're memorizing God's word, if we're hearing the preaching of God's word, and we have that in our heart, you know, when some temptation comes along, you know, the, the word of God, the Holy Spirit is going to remind us of something. You know, we're, we're tempted to look at something we shouldn't look at, and the Bible's going to say, and we're going to be reminded of that verse, you know, that if we look upon a woman to lust, you know, we've committed adultery already in our heart. You know, or, or, or to not, not be among wine bibbers. You know, whatever the sin is, you know, the Bible's, there's verses that, that God can bring up and remind us. But look, if we haven't been reading our Bibles, if we haven't been meditating in the Word of God, if we haven't heard the preaching of the Word of God, there's a void there. And when that temptation comes along, that sin comes along and tempts us, what's going to stop us from just giving in? The Holy Spirit's just like, I got nothing to work with. There's, there's nothing to bring to your remembrance again. I can't bring to your remembrance the things which have been spoken on you because you haven't been listening. And that's how a lot of people get backslidden. So this is another you know, safeguard against returning to our vomit or being like a Saul, backsliding, is to have the word of God in our heart, to not make provision for the flesh. <laughs> you say, well, not me. You know, I don't need any of that. I can stand strong. Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. I don't need the word of God. You know, I don't need to, 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 to change things in my life. I, need to, I don't need to worry about not making provision for the flesh. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that stinketh, thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You know, the guy that thinks he's just going to go through the Christian life without making any, uh, you know, changes is the guy that's going to fall. Right. The guy that thinks, well, you know, I gave up that sin a long time ago and I'm never going back to it. You are the most, the most prone person to go back, back to it. You know, like people who believe in this deliverance doctrine. You know, I used to be addicted to this or that or whatever. You know, some people get some sin in their life and they just say, well, you know, God just delivered me from that sin. I'm just completely delivered. I'm not tempted by it. You're a liar. <laughs> is what you are. And you're setting yourself up for a fall. Because that's what the Bible says. That's what the guy's saying. Well, I'm delivered. Yeah, you think you standeth. And you know what? You need to take heed lest you fall. Because that's where you're headed, is for a fall. You know, we should, we, and, and, you know, people that are more honest and say, yeah, I am tempted by this sin. You know, when I, you know, when I, when I see other people drinking, I'm tempted to drink. You know, when I see some you know, scantily clad woman, I'm tempted to go back and look at things I shouldn't look at. You know, when I see, when I, you know, when I catch a whiff of marijuana somewhere, I'm tempted to go back and, and smoke some myself. Right. When I smell, you know, I'll be perfectly honest, you know, when I, I used to smoke, <coughs> which probably explained a lot of the lung problems I have today. Right. You know, and, and I, when I was a teenager, I smoked, and I'm not in trying to, like, glorify that or anything. I wish that wasn't the case. And let me tell you something. After you quit smoking... And you, and, you, and you smell it or you try it again, it is the, like, I remember when I first started smoking, you know, trying to fit in and be cool, like, you have to choke down those first few seconds. They're the nastiest things you ever, and it's like, how did I ever think that this was enjoyable? You know, I remember the first time I did it, it was just like, oh, you know, it was terrible. And then you quit, and then I remember working at a, you know, an express oil change place at a car dealership, and, and we'd have to, you know, change people's oil, check their tire pressure, and part of the job was to go in their car and vacuum out their floorboards, back in the seat, you know, and when a smoker's car came through, oh, it was the worst. Just all that smoke is just embedded in the, in the roof lining and in the doors and the upholstery, and it was just like, how do, how do they even climb in here every day? But when you're a smoker, you're just deaf to it, you know? People have that same problem with cats. You know, people who have cat litter boxes at home. I remember delivering pizza and going to people's doors to deliver pizza, and, like, they open the door, and you just hit with this waft of just cat urine. And they're just like, thanks. And they're just like, I'm like, I'm like ear, wa eyes are tearing up. You know, I'm taking a big step back. It's like that pungent. Has everyone been around that? Have you been in a house or near that? Maybe out sewing or something? You know, hopefully not in your own house. <laughs> But it's just like, how do they do that? Because they've got nose deaf, right? <laughs> they can't smell it anymore. You know, and, and, and uh, I don't know where I'm going with all that, but, you know, sometimes that's how it is in our own life. We can't smell the sin in our life because we're just so used to it. That's not at all where I started out in that point. That's where we ended up, though. My point was, was this, was that when you, uh, when the person thinks he stands, you know, that's the guy that has to take heed lest he fall. You know, that... When we think, oh, that's not going to affect me. And keep something in 1 Corinthians 10, by the way. We'll be coming back. 
later. But, you know, one of the sin's biggest deterrents is understanding that there are consequences for sin and that none of us is above, you know, falling. But you know what? And I've already kind of made that point. The point I was trying to make is this, is that God gives us, you know, a way to avoid those pitfalls. I've kind of made my point about, you know, hey, you can fall again. You can backslide. You can go back to the vomit. It's possible. And if you don't think you're, you can, you're the, you're the prime candidate to do so. <coughs> but God gives us ways to avoid that. Not making provision for the flesh. You know, having his word in our heart. And like it says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. You know, that's a really important verse. That's something, especially if we're one that's struggling with some sin. And we think to ourselves, you know, well, nobody else is struggling like I am. No one else is, has to face this temptation like I'm facing. You know, this is unique. I'm in a very, like, no, you're not. There's no new thing under the sun. And there's no temptation that has taken you, but such is common to man. And even beyond that, you know, you're not going to be, you have not resisted yet unto blood. I don't think there's any one of us that can say that we've done what Christ said. We have not resisted unto blood like Jesus did. You know, he didn't sin to the point where he died. You know, he did not give in to the temptation of coming down off the cross, calling the 10,000 legions of angels and delivering himself. You know, he, wa he wanted that, you know, like he said, you know, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. It's not like Jesus enjoyed going to the cross, but he went there and endured that for our sakes, right? So, and the point I'm trying to make is this, is that whatever temptation you're facing in your life, whatever sin is trying to draw you back, you know, and you think, I just can't resist it, just remember what Jesus went for for you and how much, and I'm not trying to make light of that, okay? I understand that people, especially people that have gotten addicted to things, it's very hard to pull away. You know, I want to preach a sermon about that, about the power of addiction or facing the realities of addiction. Addiction is a very real thing. You know, it's something that can be a real struggle for people to break away from. But this verse should encourage us to know that we're not alone. You know, and a lot of times, maybe that's what people need in order to break free from sins in their life. Is, you know, that's why I'm not opposed to AA groups. You know, people sometimes write and say, hey, I've been going to this AA group, but they don't pray to God. They pray to some higher power. Should I even be going there? Saying, well, as long as you're not praying to some higher power, you know, as long as you're, I mean, it's our, I've never been in AA, but as far as I understand, like, you can go there and say, well, my higher power is Jesus. You know, you can say things like that. And they're like, well, good, as long as you got one. You know, look, and if that's what takes for a person to break free from the grips of alcohol and that addiction, by all means, do it. You know, and when you're there, what you realize is like, hey, there's a lot of other people in the world, you know, that struggle with alcohol. And, and whatever, the, whatever the sin is in our life, you know, there is no temptation taking you, but shuts it as common to man. But God is faithful, right? Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation make your way to escape that she may be able to bear it. You know, whenever, whenever we're tempted to go back to our sin, you know, we should, that's when we should be looking for God to deliver us. That's when we should be getting on our knees and praying and getting the word of God, maybe reaching out to somebody and saying, hey, you know, I'm going through something. Can you pray for me? Whatever, you know, there's always a way to escape. The problem is, is that we don't, always like, we don't always like to take that way to escape. Or we convince ourselves, nope, there's no way out of this. I might as well just give in. Might as well just give in the sin. I'm just, it's going to get me eventually anyway. Might as well just give in and get, the pre get it off my chest. You know, I got this monkey on my back, and if I just give in, at least I'll get it off my back. That's the wrong attitude, okay? <clears throat> and, and don't forget, you know, you might think that sounds like a good idea, but there's consequences involved every time. <clears throat> you know, and, and uh, well, let's just move on here in the story. Let's go to verse 8. It says there, And Saul disguised himself and put on another garment. So he seeks out this witch, and they say, Yeah, we found one in Endor. All right? So Saul disguises himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came by the woman by, uh, to the woman by night. You know, that's usually when people do things they shouldn't be doing, is at night. You see that over and over again. And he said, I pray thee, divide unto me uh, by the familiar spirits and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done and how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? Now this is interesting and, it, and, and I don't have an, a, a definite answer, but just the way she replies to Saul almost makes it sound like she kind of knew it was Saul. 
Yeah, she's already like, well, you know what Saul said, right? Like, she's trying to show, I'm a good girl, right? Like, maybe this is some kind of test. You're like, I'm not doing that anymore, Saul. You know, like, he's just here to kind of test me. She probably didn't know it was Saul, but sometimes I wonder that from this response. Where she's like, well, you heard what Saul said. It's like the undercover boss kind of situation. You know, I, I, whatever, whatever they send in, the, the boss who's like the head of the company or whatever. And, uh, you know, they video record him and everything like that. And, the, you know, the other people there are supposed to know who it is. Maybe somebody catches on. You're like, well, hey, that's not company policy. Look what it says here in the handbook. You know, and they, they know it's him. They're trying to, like, get away and look good, you know, earn brownie points. Maybe that's a little bit of that. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> she, but it's, you know, what she's saying there at the end, wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And, and you say, well, what's going on with that? You know, well, it's because the Bible prescribes death for witches. You know, and I, and I don't want to take a lot of time to go through all that. You know, if you read your Bible, you know this is the case, and I, I believe I preached on this in the past, but the Bible's, you know, in Deuteronomy and elsewhere, it says that those that have familiar spirits are to be executed yeah. with the death penalty. Yeah. And look, you say, well, that seems extreme. There's extreme consequences when you let people consult with familiar spirits, because are, who are they consulting with with familiar spirits? Devils, Satan. They're getting in the occult. And look, if, if God, and whether you agree with it or not, you know, if you agree with the Bible, you know, if the, the Lord condemns something, then we should condemn it too. Amen. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying we should take matters in our own hands, but how about today? How can we apply this today? Well, you know, if God condemns witchcraft, let's not have Harry Potter in the house. You know, let's not, ha that's, you know, and people want to say, well, it's not, it's harmless, it's bad. Look, I know somebody who has a child got into, into Harry Potter and I saw so many just, you know, they, they would be over by themselves casting spells and talking gibberish. And then, you know, one time I bring up the Bible in, in their parents' presence, that child began to hiss at me. <laughs> and making a face. And recoiling. <laughs> just out of nowhere. You know, I start talking Bible to this person's parents. <laughs> That's demonic. And I looked at that and I'm like, looked at the mom and she's just like, mm. I'm like, this is demonic. That same person grew up to be a full-blown sodomite today. You know, well, was it Harry Potter's fault? Well, I'll tell you what, Harry Potter didn't help. Harry Potter didn't help, you know, when he's saying, you know, I've never read Harry Potter, I've never watched the movies, I don't know what's about, but there's nothing, God, you're going to tell me there's something godly about Harry Potter? The Bible says those that have familiar spirits, witches, warlocks, necromancers, so on and so forth, casting spells, this type of thing, is condemned with death. Why would we even flirt with it? You know? And we just see, we see how it's just escalated in our own society. You know, it started out with the Wizard of Oz. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? Right. In the Bible's terms, there is no good witch, bad witch. It's just witch, right? So, look, if the Lord condemns something in, our, in, in the Bible, we should have nothing to do with it. You know, burn the Ouija board. And boy, have I got a few stories about that. Right. I, never, I think I touched one once, you know, and was like, this is such a gimmick. I really didn't believe any of it at all. But then later, you know, at that, around that same time, I had other friends who got into it, and they, I remember going to a friend's house, and, they, and I'm like, what's, they were all pale, wide-eyed, and just, you know, I'm like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, oh, we, are, we were messing around with the Ouija board later, and, and, and you know, I won't go into all the details, but, like, something demonic happened. You know, I had another friend who had similar experiences, and, you know, there was this, I'll just tell it because you're all curious, okay? <laughs> so there's this, uh, he was there, and, and, and uh, He's messing around with this Ouija board, and the one kid's like, whoa, man, I'm not messing with that. And I don't know if this kid's a Christian or anything like that. He's just like, you guys go ahead. I'm just going to hang out over here. He was in the same room, but he was just like trying to like just waiting it out, hoping it would just be over. And these guys are messing around the region, but all of a sudden that kid just starts screaming. Ah! They're like, whoa, you know, what's wrong? He's like, I felt something grab the back of my neck. You know, and, and, and look, you know, we might get curious about that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff's real. You know, my dad told me a story, and, you know, if you know my dad, you've got to kind of take everything with a grain of salt. But every now and then, you know, that's why you should never cry wolf and mess with people, because then these stories are kind of like, eh, I don't know about that. You know what I mean? But my dad, you know, he's Native American, and he, uh, he, he, he had this aunt when he was just a little boy. And one of the last great, well, I shouldn't say great, but one of the last most well-known uh, Native American uh, medicine men was Black Elk you know, which was the part of the tribe that my dad's from. And he had, and this guy was alive into the 1900s. He was a very old man. And I think he, and maybe I should corroborate the story with actual dates. But as he tells it, he was a, he was a little boy, 
And his aunt came over to their house, and she was just freaked out. And she's like, John, you know, that's my dad's name. He's like, I was over at so-and-so's house, you know, another aunt or uncle, and Black Elk showed up, and, you know, cupboards started opening, lights were flashing, things were moving around. Now, I give credence to that because is that possible for that to happen when you got a, a you know, a medicine man, which is basically, a, a, you know, a witch? Yeah. yeah, I believe that type of thing. Whether or not it actually did happen, it's very possible, right? And people can get curious about this kind of stuff and start to dabble with it. And next thing you know, they pick up a familiar spirit, you know, or they, they get involved in things and, and, and it goes way beyond what they intended. And, and it can affect the whole society. The whole society is just like, Oh, the, you know, Halloween, witches, you know, it's harmless to kind of, you know, it's harmless to kind of start to introduce kids into the occult through Harry Potter and, all, you know, whatever else is out there. I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm missing just a plethora of just demonic cartoons and things like that. You know, all kind of, you know, the, 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 the witches and the warlocks, all this kind of stuff that's out there, you know, that we shouldn't have anything to do with. <coughs> and so let's just move on with the story. It says there uh, in verse 10, so she's like, hey, why are you going to cause me to die, right? And then verse 10, and Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, as the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. And it's like, this is another clue that maybe she knew it was Saul. Like, because if he says that, like, she's thinking, wouldn't, if you didn't think that was Saul, we'd be like, well, who are you? Why, who are you to speak for Saul, right? And then she goes and does it, right? So that's kind of makes me think that this lady had a suspicion if she didn't outright, outright know that this was Saul, like, Saul, I know what's under you, you under that fake mustache or something, whatever the dis disguise was, you know. <coughs> I mean, Saul would have been a pretty well-known guy, don't you think? And if you're a witch, wouldn't you kind of like, who's been condemned, you know, by this guy, wouldn't you want to like kind of know what he looked like? I don't know. This is all conjecture, but she said, you know, he goes, hey, nothing's going to happen, you know. Well, what gives you that authority? Okay, well, anyway, verse 11 then said the woman, whom shall I bring up? So that gives her confidence, you know. And he said, bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, now, some people debate and say, well, but did Samuel really show up? I mean, this is a witch. Should we really believe her? And I understand, you know, the idea that we should be careful not to believe what the Bible tells us happened and what, or we should believe the statement and not the, you know, not just what happened in the Bible. You know, like when David's multitude, you know, taking a multitude of wives or Solomon and they're multiplying wives and people are like, oh, polygamy is okay. No, they're just telling you that that's what happens, right? Well, what does the Bible tell us what happened in the scripture? It says, and the woman, when the woman saw Samuel. So did the woman see Samuel? Yeah. Yes. And who is telling us that? The narrator of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, the scripture. It's not, doesn't read, and the, and the woman said she saw Samuel. Because then you would say, well, did she really? But the Bible's careful to tell us that she saw Samuel. And that explains why she cried with a loud voice, right? She freaks out. Now, she's probably freaking out, one, because it says there, and, and, and the woman said, spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. You know, so something about Samuel showing up confirms the fact to her that this is Saul, right? And she's like, one, I, I don't think she's worried about her life. I think she's more freaking out over the fact that it worked, <laughs> you know, that this actually worked, okay, and that's why I think she's so, sh she's so shocked, because a lot of times these people that are, you know, practice this type of thing of like palm reading, tarot cards, which are all demonic, by the way, which this is, you know, for people that consult, you know, come see, you know, dial 1-900 Miss Cleo, who remembers Miss Cleo? No, oh, a few people, okay, good. Remember that on late night, the, this Miss Cleo, the one nine hundred or eight hundred number or whatever it was that you could call, and, and she she'll she'll contact your dead relative for you over the phone, right? And pe that's what a lot of them do. These palm readers, these people that you know, will, will conjure up, you know, your your dead grandmother. You know, a lot of them are complete frauds. You know, they're just fakes. They're not. They're, it's not. It's not even that they are connecting with them. If they haven't yet, you know, they they might. But uh, one, she's either a fraud. I don't think this lady was a fraud because what she goes on it says. But that just, you know, goes to show us that, you know, these people that are, that are into this, what they're bring, what, who, they're cons who they are consulting with are not your dead relative. You know, don't believe Miss Cleo. She's, con she's contacting a devil, okay? And maybe part of the other part of the vision is, is uh, what she sees there in verse 13. And maybe this is what kind of freaked her out too, is 
She said, and the king said unto her, be not afraid for what sawest thou. So Saul just kind of is like, Don't, yeah, 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 whatever. What, what, did he, what did he see, you know? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Right? And this kind of throws people, if you kept something in 1 Corinthians 10, go back there. But, you know, what does she mean by I saw gods? Remember, it's little g, right? Yeah. And we know that the devil's called the, the, the god of this present world with a small g, right? Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 19. It says, what say I then? That the idol is anything, right? And a lot of these false gods, especially back then, they, they worshipped in the form of idols, right? Idolatry. And even today that takes place, you know, in the Catholic Church, Hinduism, Buddhism, a lot of false religions, you know, the Greek Orthodox, you know, they don't have idols, they have, you know, icons, you know, it's not a three-dimensional <coughs> idol, it's a two-dimensional, yeah, it's still an image, right? But a lot of them, they worship physical objects or pictures of things, right? They are into idolatry. And... The Bible says here in verse 19, the idol is anything, or that, that which is offered unto sacrifices, is, idols is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. So is the Bible saying, hey, when they sacrifice to some idol, they're just sacrificing to some inanimate object. No, he's saying behind those inanimate objects is a devil. You know, and I believe a lot of that you know, is what's going on in, in these Catholic churches and others and, and Buddhism. And Hinduism, I mean, look at their gods that they make up. They're demonic looking. You know, they got like eight arms. They're cutting heads off and everything. You know, it's, it's scary stuff. It give you nightmares. They, it's like, it's not much of a stretch to think, oh, yeah, there's probably a demon involved there. Right. And these devils, these, these demons, you know, they, they want to receive glory. They want to be worshipped. But, you know, no one in their right mind is just going to worship a straight up devil. I mean, other than devil worshippers, you know, they're out there, right? But even a lot of times these satanic churches and stuff, they're just trying to make a political statement, right? They really don't believe it. They're just trying to trigger Christians or whatever. But, you know, the devil, these devils, they, they want to receive glory and worship. So what a lot of times I believe that they do is they, they put themselves out there as a Hindu god, as some dead saint, you know, or as some relic or whatever. A lot, and that's what the Bible says, that the, when they sacrifice unto idols, they sacrifice unto devils. And these devils, you know, are, you know, I, or what's behind idolatry and what are idols to these people? They're gods, right? That's when they, that they consider them as these different gods. And so when she says, I saw gods ascending out of the earth, I believe what she's referring to the fact is that she saw the demonic world, right? She saw this, 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 this spiritual realm and she saw demons. You know, and that's kind of a scary thought. You know, I don't want to frighten anybody with that, but... You know, we don't see it, but that is the, we, we are in that realm. We are spiritual beings living in a spiritual realm. There are demonic forces at work, even in this earth, you know, even about us, that we just can't see it. God has, you know, put a veil there. We can't see that, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, okay? So that, I believe that's what she means there is when she says, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. You say, well, are you saying Samuel was a devil? no. You know, it says, you know, I believe she just her, had her eyes open. She sees this and then Samuel. It doesn't, it, you know, it's God's plural, okay? She's seeing a lot of things going on. And the Bible isn't giving us a lot of detail here. A lot of this we just have to kind of infer, look to other scriptures. But, you know, I believe she saw Saul. And it says there in verse 14, And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. Now some people say, Oh, he cometh up. See, dispensationalism. He came up out of hell. You know, he came up out of Abraham's bosom. You know, the cool part of hell. You know, the nice part of hell. Look, there is no nice part of hell. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be hell, right? And you say, well, it says he cometh up. But we use that same terminology today. Hey, hey, are you going to show up at such and such a place? You know, I'm going to look this guy up. I'm going to call him up. I'm going to, hey, I'm going to hit you up later, you know? It's just, and she's the one that initiated that. You know, who shall I call up? It's not talking about a direction, it's just a manner of speaking, okay? And he said, an old man cometh up. You know, he, he, he appears, he manifested, he was conjured, he, he came forth. You know, it's not saying he came up out of the earth, okay? It was the devils, it was the gods that came, were sending out of the earth. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel and stooped his face to the ground and bowed himself. So did Saul see him? We really don't know. The, the way the conversation's kind of going, you know, she has to describe him to him. I don't believe Saul... Or Samuel, excuse me, yeah, Saul saw Samuel. And it says in verse 15, And Samuel said to Saul, so he might not have seen him, but now he's hearing this voice, which would be even creepier, right? 
Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? You know, Saul's like, hey, I was in heaven, bud. You know, and what are you doing? Didn't I tell you? And, 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 and he goes on. And, you know, the, the proof that this is Saul is that everything he says to him is right. He recounts everything that has gone on with Sam, like everything that he's told Saul in the past, everything that God has said to him is 100% accurate. And then beyond that, he makes a prediction that, hey, tomorrow at this time, you, you and your son shall be with me. And we know from the scripture that that came true, right? So this isn't demonic. This isn't a devil. This is Saul, okay? And he's saying, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? You know, I was hanging out in heaven. I don't want to be down here. Look, I had enough the first time. And so answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. So he's doing all this, hoping, in desperation, that Saul's going to come to him and say, well, hey, you know, if you go to this place, this time, and you say, array your men like this, you're going to have the victory. Is that what he gets? No. It's, it's Saul's like, or Samuel's just like, you want to you disquiet me and call me up? Let me just give you a scathing rebuke. <laughs> That's what he gives him here. Then said Samuel, verse 16, when, uh, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee? That's not what Saul wanted to hear. But, you know, praise God for a, a prophet like Samuel who just, you know, even, even when a guy is at his lowest, he's still not afraid to tell him the truth. You know, he's not going to be like, well, you know, maybe, maybe Saul's had enough. Maybe I'll just tell him, you know, hey, it's not going to be that bad. People are going to die. You're going to lose. But, you know, now he's just like, why did you call me up? The Lord has departed from thee. He's like, he's ripping his face. And it's become thine enemy. That's a scary thought. Look, you could have a lot of enemies in this world that might, might even make us a little bit afraid. But when the Lord becomes your enemy, I mean, who's going who's gonna to deliver you from the Lord? Amen. Nobody. That's the last person you want as your enemy. But this is where we find Saul. And the Lord had... And he said, And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek. So he's referring back to when he was told to go and wipe out all the Amalekites, and he saved the king, uh, Agag, and the best of the sheep and the oxen, right, to sacrifice. And he made that big excuse of, oh, the people, you know, they forced me. They wanted to do it. <laughs> That's what he's referring back to. And, it's, you know, and that's been a while, right? And he's saying, look, you should have learned this lesson then. Like I told you back then that this is what's going to happen. And if you recall that story, it says in David, or excuse me, in Saul, you know, Samuel saw, or Saul saw Samuel no more after that. So a long time has gone by, you know, he's re seeing his old buddy and he's getting his face ripped. And he's saying, look, he has rent the kingdom out of the hand to give it to thy neighbor and to David, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek, Therefore, the Lord done this thing unto thee to, to, to this day. You know, and he could have just stopped there and been like, there's your answer. God's your enemy. God's not going to be with you. You know, and here's why. Because of what you did. You already knew all this. Why are you calling me up? You know, nothing's changed, buddy. But then he goes on in verse 19. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel into, thine, into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. You know, and that's, of course, a, an important scripture about suicide, Right? Because we know how the story ends with Saul. It says he fell on his own sword. And it wasn't because he was like running with scissors. You know, he did that on purpose. When he saw that the Philistines were going to come and he asked his armor bearer to do it, he won't do it. And it says, and he fell on his own sword. You know, he, what, you know, what, are the, what was that, the, the, the Japanese, the uh, Bushido do? I think that's what it's called, Bushido. You know, when they, rather than admit defeat, they would take a, a large dagger or a sword and pierce their own stomach and like rip themselves open in World War II. You know, it's crazy, right? But that's what Saul did, you know? Rather than being having his body defiled by these Philistines, which happened anyway, by the way, he commits suicide. But where does the Bible say he was going to end up after he committed suicide? You know, the greatest of all sins, according to the Catholic Church. You know, and, and here's the thing about that. And I, don't, I don't tell people this at the door when I'm soul winning. So let me get it off my chest here. Is that, uh, you know, to me, suicide's not the worst thing. I mean, think about it. I, I would rather have somebody commit suicide than kill somebody else. I mean, I think going and killing somebody else is worse. I'm not saying suicide isn't a big deal. You know, it's like, hey, it's, it's cool. It's a sin, but it's not the worst thing. You know, it's not like on par with stealing. But people make suicide. Like, and we ask people, and I always test people on this in the door usually, is, 
It's like, well, hey, what if, you know, I committed suicide? You know, that's the example I use. You know, what if I got into sin and, and there were all these consequences and then I got so down about it that I committed suicide? And a lot of times people will be like, yeah, yeah. It's, they'll be getting the gospel and then you bring that one question up and they're just like, well, I don't know about that. Which is why I bring it up, right? Because they've been taught that that's the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin. No, that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is the unpardonable sin, okay? But, you know... The Bible's showing us here that when, when Saul commits suicide, he was going to go be with Samuel. And Samuel, we know, was in heaven. Okay? You know, another great example is Samson. You know, unfortunately, people are so ignorant of the Bible today, they don't even know these stories anymore. You know, otherwise, they'd be great examples to, to point them to about suicide. But how did Samson die? You know, he asked God for the strength to push the two pillars apart. And guess what God did? Gave him the strength to push the two pillars apart and bring the whole house down upon him. And he killed more Philistines in his death than in his life. But where did he go? Went to heaven. You know, he's, he's in the hall of faith, Hebrews 11. We know he's in heaven. So it's a great example for that. Maybe you can mark that in your Bible. If, you have, if you're looking for a good verse on suicide, this is a great passage to turn to. And it's a great passage to show because Samuel or Saul was a very wicked guy. I mean, he did a lot of bad things. I mean, killing priests and then killing himself. You know, that these, are big, these are sins, right? That we could show people, but we know that he went to heaven. Anyway, let me move on here. It says in verse 20, Then Saul fell straightway all along uh, on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. Well, boo-hoo. You know, what did you expect going to a witch? Like, he's going to come give you good news? And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. And the woman, and this is it. I'm going to close on this thought here, verse 21. And the woman... And now, who was the woman? The witch, right? The one that consulted her familiar spirits. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't see Saul in this, you know, getting this bad news and being, you know, on his face on the ground, weak, no strength, and just kick him in the ribs and be like, get out of here. You know, which, you know, this is a wicked woman. This woman is wicked, okay? This isn't a good woman. This woman is, you know, consult her with familiar spirits. You know, and the Bible condemns that with death. You know, she, she is a very wicked person. But it says here, When the woman came unto Saul and saw that he was sore troubled and said unto him, Behold, thine handmaid hath obeyed thy voice, and I have put my life in mine hand and have hearkened unto thy words which thou spakest unto me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat that thou mayest have strength and thou goest on thy way. But he refused and said, I will not eat. But it, you know, you might as well eat, Saul. It's your last meal, buddy. You know, you buy, and I don't know about the morsel of bread. I'd be asking for a, you know, a T-bone steak or something because this is it for you. And he says, I will not eat, but his servants together with the woman compelled him. So this woman, this wicked woman is coming to Saul and seeing him in this pathetic state and saying, oh, you should eat something. You know, she's, she's showing compassion, right? She's showing empathy. She's trying to help him. She's trying to, you know, and I don't think she's doing it because she's trying to butter him up and spare her own life. She's already said, look, you know, you spared my life, eat something. So he arose from the bed and sat upon, from the earth rather, and sat upon the bed, and the woman had a fat calf in the house. That's more like it, you know. Forget the bread. And she hastened to kill it, took flour and kneaded it, and did bake unleavened bread thereof. So, you know, she's even making unleavened bread, you know. She's being, you know, kind of spiritual here. And she brought it before Saul and before his servants, and they did eat, and they rose up and went away that night. And so what am I getting at here? Is this, this is a wicked woman, but she's doing something very nice, isn't she? Isn't that nice of her? Wasn't well, that a nice gesture? Instead of just like saying, telling Saul, well, hey, that's going to be 500 shekels. You know, or here's my going rate. Or you might as well just get out of here. You know, go on. All right, well, go get something to eat. Good luck with tomorrow. You know, she doesn't just kick him out. She's like, well, let me bring you something. Gets the fatted calf, makes bread, you know, kneads it, bakes it, brings him fresh bread and fresh meat. It's a very nice thing to do for somebody. Look, if, if you don't believe me, make me some nice fresh bread and some fresh meat and, and look at the smile that gets on my face. You know? I would say, you're a very nice person. I would say thank you. Right? And if you don't believe me, you can try that out. But uh, what this shows us is that wicked people can be nice. You know? and, she, and whether or not this woman's completely reprobate, she probably is. You know, it, it shows us even the most wicked of people still know how to be nice to other people. You say, well, what's the point? My point is this, don't let them fool you. You know, and the world's really struggling with this right now, aren't they? Because we have an element in our, so in our society called the sodomites, right? Which are the, the, the scum of the earth, 
the most wicked people there are, reprobates, implacable, full of all unrighteousness, okay? And I, I would direct you towards, you know, the, the sermon I preached on Sunday morning, which has been taken down, right? But you can find it elsewhere. See me after the service if you'd like to know where. But, because um, this is live right now. But, uh, but even those people, as wicked as they are, how are they often perceived? As nice people. And they're wicked people. But a lot of people today are walking around thinking, oh, they're so nice. Why is that? Because that's how they put themselves out there. You know, in the sitcoms, in the movies, in, in, in the children's books that they're reading to them in the public schools. You know, they're not telling them the truth. They're, they're putting on a show. And, and, even, and even people in a lot of times in their personal life, you'll, they'll hear preaching about the sodomites and how they're condemned to death and so on and so forth and how wicked they are. And they'll say, well, the sodomite I know isn't like that. You know, I know some homos and they don't ever act like that. Yeah, are you with them 24-7? It's a good thing you're not. You know, or it just might be that they know how to act around certain people. They know how to behave to kind of give, you know, to pull the wool over people's eyes and make them think there's something that they're not. I think it's a great example of that in Scripture. Here you have this witch who's consulting with familiar spirits, a wicked woman, if not a reprobate herself, coming to Saul in a low moment and doing something very nice for him. Wicked people can be nice. They can care about other people when they want to. You know, and, and they aren't always obvious, right? The Bible says in Matthew, Beware of false prophets which come unto you in sheep's clothing. How does a false prophet come? As a sheep. You know, he's gentle, he's nice. Would people look at Joel Osteen and think, what a, what a mean person. Does Joel Osteen come across as a mean guy to you? Always smiling, always telling cute little jokes before his service. Great hair, great teeth. Does he come across as a mean guy? And the people that go to church, I've, I've been in Houston more than once and gotten a lift ride. You know, I was, I was uh, preaching down there in Pure Words, and I'd get a ride to the airport or whatever. And I remember one time I got in a car and she, this lady, the, the driver's like, oh, I, oh, you're going to church? Yeah, I just came from Joel's church. She meant Joel Olstein, right? And she's just going on about how great Joel is. She, she didn't say, oh, that, and he's, he's you know, he's, he's kind of a mean guy at Joel. He's kind of, he's kind of a bad, bad dude, right? But you know what Joel Olstein is? He's a false prophet. He is a false prophet. You know, that's, and I'm going long, I don't want, I, and I want to respect your time. But that's what he is. And I'm just making the point, like, that's how false prophets come. That's how wicked, evil people come into your life. Nice. You know, I preached in, in Psalms chapter 6 a little while ago about the flatterer, right? They don't just come and say, hey, I want to destroy you. Hey, I want to preach false doctrine. I want to split the church. That's not what they do. They come in, they creep in like a wolf in sheep's clothing. They come nice. And this is a great example of here in this, in this passage of, of exactly that. A wicked person who still has the capacity to do nice things for people. Don't let it fool you. And you know what I mean to say by saying this? That, that you know, wicked people are not worthy of our sympathy. You know, and, and I mean that about Saul. Saul has everything coming to him. He deserves exactly what's going to happen. God is just. And, you know, the temptation a lot of times is, is that, you know, we, we don't want to dole out the punishment that's meat. A lot of times we'll read it and you know, say, well, this is what the law says. This is what the scripture says. And that's why the Bible says that we are not to be a respecter of persons. And that we should not pity them. You know, we should, when people are found guilty, you know, when they are worthy, then they need to be punished. And Saul, remember what we're going to read you know, shortly about Saul. Don't, don't get a soft spot for him. I mean, it's sad that it, things turned out that way. It's unfortunate that it, it was the way it was. It didn't have to be that way. That's the sad part about it. But that doesn't excuse Saul from his comings, okay? He, that he gets what he deserves, okay? So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.